to see all of you. I know I, I probably speak for all of you and I say, I truly missed being with all of you. It's so special when we're able to come together with our brothers and sisters. There's such an encouragement that we draw from being in each other's presence. And it's so good to be able to do that today. And like Brother Don mentioned in his prayer, to be able to get back to the point of having regular services as we're accustomed to. And so we certainly are excited about that. And we're really excited about our gospel meeting. Uh, those of you who were here at the lectureship last year and were able to hear Brother DeBerry, you know of his speaking abilities, and we certainly uh, look forward to his being with us next week. And so please make plans to be here for that. You know, memories can be a very strange thing. I find myself quite often starting to tell a story or to recall a certain event only to be interrupted by someone, usually it's by Christy or one of the kids, telling me that I don't have all the facts just quite right. And then they commence to telling their side of the story. You know, we agree on the main information. We agree on those main details. But then when it comes to the small things, the things I remember may not be the same things that they remember. But in our minds... We're right. In our minds, what we remember, that's the truth. That's the reality of the situation. Our memory certainly is a very interesting thing, but also in this same vein, the things that we choose to remember and the things that we choose to forget can say a lot about who we are. With that in mind, Open your Bibles, you may still have it open to the scripture reading this morning, Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, I want us to back up to verse 11, and we're going to read down through the end of the chapter. And what I want us to notice from this passage this morning is what the Apostle Paul tells the church in Ephesus that they need to remember. He says, wherefore, remember that ye being in times past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at times ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace." who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. Very plainly, what Paul is telling the church in Ephesus is that at one point, you had no hope. At one point, you were lost. You had no hope of heaven. There was nothing there to give you any type of motivation to live your life in a certain way. He said, but now all of this has changed. But now... All of that has been left in the past. Why? Because Jesus came. Because he died on the cross for all mankind. But the interesting thing that we see in this passage, Paul is telling these Ephesian Christians, do not forget the past. Don't forget who you once were. Now it's very easy for us as Christians to become forgetful when it comes to our past. It may be that there are things in our past that when we think about those things, 
they're discouraging to us. There may be things in our past that are painful for us to think about. But the Apostle Paul tells us we need to remember who we were. Remember who we were. It's an important thing that we don't forget what our old way of life was like. What we have been able to lay aside. And the reason why that is so important that we don't forget those things is because, folks, if we forget who we were, it becomes very easy for us to look down upon those who are now where we once were. Those who are still out in the world, who are lost in sin, who are in the position where each and every one of us were before we became children of God, it becomes very easy for us to look at ourselves and think, well, we're better than they are. We're Christians. We're not living a life of sin. Well, we are so much better than they are. Folks, that's a very dangerous attitude for us to develop. Or we may even look at those young Christians and we may see those who continue to struggle from time to time, who continue to slip up and, and, and fall back into sin from time to time. You know, just because you become a Christian, it does not mean that temptation ends. Folks, as soon as you become a child of God, Satan's going to rev up the temptations. He's going to do everything in his power to get you to fall away from this new decision that you've made. And that's why we see many young Christians who struggle as they mature in the faith. Each and every one of us have times that we've slipped and sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And how would it have made us feel if an older, mature Christian that we looked up to was looking down on us, was condemning us because we made a mistake? Folks, this is why we need to remember who we were. Remember what that old life was like. The real issue that we're facing with this is pride. And certainly in this life, we need to have a degree of healthy pride. We refer to it as self-esteem. We need to have a confidence about ourselves. But when we fall victim to pride, viewing ourselves on a level higher than we belong, then we begin to glorify self rather than glorify God. Remember what Solomon said about pride in Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 18? He said that pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. This morning what I would like for us to do for the remainder of our lesson, I'd like to share with you three great men of faith. People that we continue to look up to even today for the people that they become. But more pertinent to our lesson this morning, I want to remind you of who they were. Let's begin by talking about Moses. Moses, without question, became a great man of faith. A man that we continue to look up to for the things that he accomplished. As we addressed in our lesson last Sunday, remember, Moses had a unique relationship with God. He was able to communicate with God in such a way that no one else was able to communicate in this same way. He became the leader of his people. He performed miracles before the most powerful man on earth at this time. And he secured the release of his people from slavery. God later would deliver the law to him, this law being that which would govern the lives of the Israelites. It started with the initial Ten Commandments and eventually evolved into 613 individual laws that made up the law of Moses. But without a doubt, one of the greatest events that took place with Moses was when he appeared in spiritual form with Elijah on the Mount of Transfiguration. In Matthew chapter 17, beginning in verse 2, it says, And he, referring to Christ, was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto him Moses and Elijah talking with him. Wouldn't you love to know that conversation? 
Wouldn't you love to know what they were discussing with Christ on that occasion? Well, that's not recorded for us, but without a doubt, Moses was a great man of faith. But who did Moses used to be? Who was Moses before he became this great man of faith? Well, folks, first off, Moses never should have survived infanthood. He never should have reached the point where he became an adult. You may remember in Exodus chapter 1 and verse 22 that Pharaoh had made a decree prior to the birth of Moses. He said, every son that is born to the Hebrews shall be cast into the Nile, shall be cast into this river, but the daughters shall be allowed to live. Well, we remembered through the intervention of God that Moses was spared from the waters of the Nile and it was Pharaoh's own daughter who spared his life and he was raised there in the palace of Egypt. He's oftentimes referred to as a prince of Egypt because he was raised as Pharaoh's own daughter. But not only should Moses have never have survived infanthood, we see that as he grew up, he even reached the point where he became a fugitive and exiled himself from Egypt. You may remember in Exodus chapter 2, beginning in verse 11, that when Moses had grown up, he went out one day and he was looking at where his people, the Hebrew people, he was out there watching them work, watching them toil. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew. Well, he intervened. And he went over and he killed this Egyptian. Trying to hide what he had done, he went out and he hid the body of the Egyptian in the sand. Well, after that, the next day, he went out and he saw two Hebrews fighting with each other. And he went over and he tried to break up this fight. Now remember, he thought that he had hidden his crime. He thought that nobody knew that he had killed this Egyptian. But when he went over and he tried to break up this fight between two of his own brethren, they said, what are you going to do, paraphrasing, what are you going to do? Are you going to kill us too? Just like you killed this Egyptian, are you going to kill us too? Well, Moses became afraid. He knew that the information about what he had done had gotten out. And he knew that his life would be in danger if Pharaoh found out what he had done. So he fled from Egypt. And in such a strange turn of events, he ended up in the land of Midian working as a shepherd. In the eyes of the Egyptians, do you know what the lowest level of society was considered? Shepherds. So here was a man who went from being the prince of Egypt to now because of this one action that he took, he now was considered by the Egyptian people as the lowest level in society. A shepherd. Well, after leaving Egypt, I'm sure that his self-confidence was pretty low. I'm sure that he felt like that there was nothing that he could accomplish. But then in Exodus chapter 3 and 4, we find that that all changed. For God appeared to Moses in the form of a burning bush. A bush that was on fire but was not consumed by the fire. And God began to speak to Moses and reveal his plan to him that he was going to be the one that was going to go back to Egypt and was going to lead the Hebrew people out of that place, was going to take them to the promised land. Well, do you remember what Moses said? He said, uh -uh, I can't do it. He said, I'm not the right choice. I'm sure that this was his self-confidence that was speaking here. He was looking at these things in his past, these things that he had done wrong, and he was saying, there's nothing that I can do that is going to be beneficial to the Lord. He was remembering these things in his past, and he was allowing this to be motivation to turn him away from doing what God wanted him to do. Every time God would speak to him and try to encourage him, he had some excuse as to why he couldn't do it. 
For example, we read in Exodus 4 and verse 10 where God had just shown Moses these miracles that he was going to be able to perform. And Moses still said, Oh my Lord, I'm not eloquent either in past or since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and of tongue. And then he would go on to say just a couple verses later in verse 13, Please send somebody else. He didn't want to do it. He didn't feel worthy of this task. He didn't think he had the ability to do this. But this is the man who God would groom into the leader of his nation. A man that we still view as a great man of faith today. Why? Because he was able to overcome his past. Yes, he remembered the things of his past. But he did not let them motivate the future. David's another example of a man that if people knew of his past, they probably would have looked down upon him. In fact, in many ways, David seems the least likely person to ever be chosen the king of Israel. And really, he seems like the least likely person that would ever really accomplish anything good. But yet, David was the man that we see in 1 Samuel 17 that was willing to go up against the giant Goliath. Goliath was the champion of the Philistines, the enemies of the Hebrews. And when David went out to visit with his brothers who were soldiers, he saw this giant come out. The scriptures tell us that Goliath stood six cubits and a span. Now if this is a standard cubit that they're talking about, folks, we're talking about nine feet, nine inches tall. That's a tall guy. That's a big man. And here he comes. He comes out and he's taunting the people, challenging them to send out their champion. Well, what did the Hebrews do? They went and hid. They would not even step out in sight of Goliath. But here we have this young boy who more than likely was still a teenager at this time. He steps out. Well, I'm sure Goliath probably thought this was a joke. And he begins to taunt David. And he begins to taunt the Hebrews. Is this the best you have? Is this boy the best that you have? Well, Goliath says to David, he says, Come on, he says, come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the field. But here you had Goliath, this trained soldier with all of his armor, with all of his weapons, and here steps this young boy, here steps David with a slingshot and a rock. Slings one stone, hits the giant in the forehead, knocks him down, and David takes Goliath's own sword takes off his head, claiming the giant's life. Now, this one action led him to being a hero among his people. Of course, the king didn't like this. It evoked great displeasure with Saul. But the women of the Hebrews, they began to sing a song. Saul has struck down his thousands, and David his tens of thousands. This is also the man that God would choose to be the king of Israel. We see in 1 Samuel 16 where Saul has sinned and God is fed up with it. He's not going to allow Saul to continue as his anointed king. So he sends the prophet Samuel out to the household of Jesse of Bethlehem. Well, Jesse brings in seven of his sons. And he has these seven sons all walk past Samuel. Samuel's waiting on God to pick out the one that he has chosen to be king. Well, all seven of these sons go by. They're examined by God. They're examined by Samuel. And God tells Samuel, I don't choose any of these men. So Samuel goes to Jesse and he says, are these all of your sons? Jesse says, well, I have one more. He says, I have the youngest. The youngest son, the eighth son. Said, and he's out with the sheep. Well, David is finally called in from the field. 
He passes in front of Samuel and God says, Samuel, this is the one. This is the one that you need to anoint. This is the one that's going to be the next king of Israel. A shepherd boy. This is also the man that later in his life God would refer to as a man after his own heart. A man through whose lineage the Messiah was going to come. Yes, David became a great man of faith. But let's think about who he was before he became this great man of faith. He was never meant to be king. Saul was the one that was chosen by God to be the first king of Israel. It was his successor, Jonathan, that should have become king. But because of the sins of Saul, this royal line of succession was removed from his family. And it passed on to someone else. If it wasn't for the intervention of God, David never would have even been considered to be king. He wouldn't have even been in a position to be qualified to be king. But along this same vein, we see that he, among all of his brothers, was the least likely to be chosen to be king. We see this in the actions of his own father. For when the prophet comes to Jesse and asks Jesse to bring his sons out so that they can be considered. Notice he only brings seven. He only brings the oldest seven. Well, more than likely these were men that that were stronger, they were more highly thought of among the family members. Of course, we see, especially in that culture, there were special, uh, special things that were passed on to the oldest child. More than likely, Jesse was thinking that one of these older ones will certainly be the one that is chosen. But not David. David was a shepherd. So Jesse didn't even bother. Jesse thought, you know, there, there's no chance whatsoever that David will be the one chosen. So I'm not even going to call him in. It wasn't until Samuel asked, do you have any more sons? That Jesse, I mean, and you see almost a defeated nature to him at this point. Well, yeah, I have one more. Yeah, I have, I have the youngest son, but he's, he's just out watching the sheep. Even his own father didn't really see anything special about him. That he was the one that was chosen to become king. There were other things that took place in David's life that certainly were sinful, that were trying times. But David did not let his past hold him back from being a great man of God. Now let's consider just briefly one example from the New Testament. We see a figure in the New Testament who came from terrible backgrounds to become one of the greatest men that has ever walked the face of this earth. A man who in the eyes of God was a great man of faith, a man who we consider today a great man of faith, a man who we trust, who we look to for the truth. Of course, I'm talking about the Apostle Paul. Well, first let's see what Paul became. Paul became a great missionary, traveling around the known world at that time. We read through the second half of the book of Acts and we see his travels detailed uh, for us there. He took three missionary journeys. He took a trip to Rome going throughout that part of the world, establishing congregations, leading souls to Christ, teaching, writing, doing all that he could to further the cause of Christ. It's even believed that after the book of Acts ended, remember he's in prison in Rome, Tradition tells us that he was set free. Uh, he won his independence at that time. But then he went all the way to Spain. He went into the British Isles. He continued to preach until finally he was once again captured and put to death by the Romans. Here was a man whose life was consumed with Christ, with doing all that he could to lead people to the truth. He was an author. He wrote over half of the New Testament. 
of the 27 books that are contained therein, we know that he wrote 13, possibly 14, of those books that are contained therein. Very prolific. There's other indications in the scriptures as well that he even wrote other letters, other things that were not compiled into the scriptures. But what was he before? Who was Paul? Well, he was Saul of Tarsus. He was a leader among the Jews, an unbeliever, one who had no faith in Christ whatsoever. He was from Tarsus. He was um, a student of a man by the name of Gamaliel. Gamaliel also was a highly respected Jewish leader, but again, was one who had no faith in Jesus Christ. Now, it's bad enough what I've said so far that he had no faith in Christ. But Saul of Tarsus was more than an unbeliever. He was an enemy of God. We're first introduced to him in Acts chapter 7. He was present at the execution of a young evangelist by the name of Stephen. He stood by. He endorsed this action. He gave the authority for this execution to take place. And he stood there and he held the garments of those who were actually stoning this man. He continued to wreak havoc upon the churches in and around Jerusalem. But then he decided that he wanted to branch out. He went to the Jewish leaders. He got letters of recommendation to go to Damascus and persecute the church there. But on the way, his life changed. On the way, he came into contact with Christ. And we see that immediately he recognized the error of his ways. Immediately he cried out to Jesus and said, Lord, what would you have me to do? Well, Jesus told him, said, go on into the city of Damascus and there it will be told you what you must do. He was led into Damascus for he was stricken blind by the brightness of the sun of that day of Jesus' presence. For three days he prayed and he fasted. You think he was repentant? You think he was a changed man in a lot of ways at that point? You better believe it. But there was still something lacking, folks. He was not a saved man at that point. Because after three days of praying and fasting, Ananias came to him. He saw the change of heart in this man. He saw that he was now a believer in Christ. He saw that he was repentant. And he looked at him and he said, And now why tarriest thou arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord? Saul's sight was restored. He was taken. He was baptized. And he began at that point living a life of total devotion to Christ. But what does this all mean to us? Well, this is where our passage from Ephesians chapter 2 comes into play. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, Paul writes that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. All of us have a past. Some of us may have a past that's worse than others. I can remember in Bible class one time I had a, uh, an older lady ask me about this. She said, you know, she said, that's something that I really struggle with. She said, because I was raised in the church. She said, and whenever I look at my life now, she said, it's really not that different than it was before I became a Christian. She said, I know that I was lost. She said, I know that because I had not been baptized. I had not received the blood of Christ in that sense. She said, but it's hard for me to, to wrap my mind around this concept about having lived a life of wickedness when my life really wasn't that much different. Well, folks, the difference that we see there is Christ. The passage here tells us very plainly that without Christ, you are without hope. 
The Gentiles had no hope until the coming of Christ. You and I have no hope until we come to Christ. Until we become children of God. But tying this in with our lesson for today, folks, we all need to stop and think about who we once were. Think about what our past life was like. Those things that we engaged in, those sins that were a part of our life, those things that we allowed to come between us and God. And if we've laid those things aside, folks, we need to praise God today for that. We need to be thankful to God that he sent his son to pay that price. As David mentioned in preparing our thoughts for the Lord's Supper, Jesus paid a debt that he didn't owe. He paid that price for you and I so that we could leave the past in the past. But it may be that there's someone here this morning that you examine yourself and you find that there's things in your life that you need to leave in the past. Things that you need to have taken away by the blood of Christ. Well, if you're a child of God and that's the situation that you're in today, then we encourage you to come forward and make that known. Let us go to the Father in prayer on your behalf and be restored to the faith. Or if you've never become a child of God, then we would encourage you this morning to place your faith in Jesus Christ. If you believe that he is the Son of God, then repent of your sins. Turn away from those things. Leave them in the past. Come forward, confess that faith that you have in Christ and be baptized. Your sins will then be washed away in the blood of Christ through the waters of baptism. You'll be added to the Lord's church and you can begin today living that faithful Christian life. Yes, folks, we need to remember the past. We need to remember who we were. But we don't need to allow that to motivate who we are. We're Christians. We're saved people. And God wants us to continue to live that type of life. And so this morning, if you examine yourself and there's a spiritual need that we can help you with in any way, we encourage you to come while we stand and sing. These have allured my sight.